Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about things you may not know about Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, and we're really lucky to have an amazing guest today, Matt Frad from the Pints of Aquinas podcast, to tell us so many cool things that you've never heard about the angelic doctor. Now, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but the rumor is, is that he was a chubby, fat priest, and they had to cut out a circle in his table, and he would just eat and study. But I also heard that he was a very slender man and austere. So let's find out more about Thomas Aquinas. Great. It's good to be uh, back with you guys. Matt Frad, thank you for joining us. Um, I can't think of a better saint to dive into than St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the most prolific writers in the Catholic Church, somebody that a lot of Catholics can benefit from knowing more about. And Matt, I have to say, your work specifically with Aquinas is impressive. You are a perfect person to have on the show to talk about St. Thomas Aquinas. But there's a lot of things that are kind of misappropriated when it comes to him, that he was like a glutton almost. But his austere practices is something that's really held up very highly in church tradition. And I remember learning that at Ave Maria University. I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, our our listeners have been asking, please get Matt on the podcast. Now, for those of you who aren't aware of what Matt does, um, he does the Pints with Aquinas podcast, a enormously successful and po popular uh, podcast. Um, and he really takes a lot of approaches to a lot of issues in the church and culture through a Thomistic lens. And really, uh, it's a real honor to have you here. Our, you know, our listeners are saying, please get Matt on. So really cool opportunity. So thanks for coming on, Matt. Yeah, I'm honored to be on. Thanks a lot. In today's episode, we want to talk a little bit about things people might not have realized about Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, a lot of times you can see pictures of him. You can see, you know, you can hear of the books that he wrote or the philosophical treatises that he wrote, and they can seem so distant and seem so you know, two-dimensional, right? And so, um, you know, academic. But behind that academic and that structured mind, there was a deeply mystical beating heart of a saint. Mm. And those are some of the things that we hope to explore a little bit today and tell you some things about why Aquinas is so much more than a, a name in a book, but really a, a living, breathing saint that can be modeled, can be emulated, and your life can be benefited by knowing more about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it was Joseph Pieper in his work on Thomas Aquinas, he says something to the effect of, Augustine is beautiful like a garden is beautiful. Thomas Aquinas is beautiful in the way a tool is beautiful. Uh, I might change that and say like a you know board game instruction manual is beautiful. Like there is a particular <laughs> beauty to the writings of Thomas Aquinas um, that is different to how we usually think of the beautiful writings of the saints. And so sometimes you read Thomas Aquinas, do you think is this was this written by a man or a computer? But yeah, as you say, he was a poet, he was a mystic uh, and a saint. Right. So about what time frame was Aquinas' life? Why don't you tell everyone just a little bit about, you know, the early stages of where he came from? Yeah, so Thomas Aquinas was born in the 13th century in a place called Rocca Secca, which is not too far from Naples in Italy. Um, he was born to a pretty prestigious family. He was sent to Monte Cassino, which was the a monastery founded by St. Benedict himself. He was sent there when he was five to do his studies. He would have been an oblate, so he would have worn the Benedictine habit, um, but hadn't made final vows and wasn't expected to make final vows, obviously, until he was old enough. Uh, there was a sort of political unrest in the region, and so uh, he had to continue his studies elsewhere. Uh, he encountered... I don't, I don't want to get too, too far ahead if you want to kind of pause on any of this, oh, but he encountered... Please. Uh, the Dominican uh, order, which was a new order, uh, up until the 13th century, the religious orders tended to take uh, vows of uh, staying in one place, as it were. These new orders, which were called the mendicant orders, it comes from the Latin mendicare, which means to beg. Uh, they arose in response to certain heresies that were gaining ground in the church during that time, uh, the Albigensians, for example. And uh, one of the kind of 
things these Albigensians and other heretics were doing is they were living these austere lives, which sort of showed just how perhaps wealthy and um, loose the church and the religious had become at the time. And so they were trying to fight fire with fire, as it were. You know, they were trying to say, okay, like we, we will match you in what's good, going back to the Bible, going back to holy poverty, but we won't be heretics. And so that's how you kind of get the Franciscans and the Dominicans arising during that time. And um, it was a really turbulent time in Italy in the 13th century. We tend to think of it as rather idyllic, but you have the, well, the rise of the new, as I say, mendicant orders, the, the new universities, which were new. Yeah. <laughs> I said news, so there you go. Uh, the, um, the threat of Islam, you have new uh, translations of Aristotle that are causing a lot of uh, confusion in the church at the time. So, you know, there was a lot of kind of turbulence going on. Um, yeah, you know, so I mean, it, yeah, you go. Aquinas, Aquinas going over, you know, his, his uncle uh, was the abbot of Monte Cassino. Monte Cassino, you know, most famous Benedictine monastery in the world. And that's, you know, he was almost handpicked to become the next abbot there. He's being groomed for that. And this isn't a really established, you know, this is a powerful established order. And going to the Dominicans, that's like, um, you know, and maybe in today's analogy, your your son is destined to be the next CEO of your company and he decides he wants to go be a TikTok influencer. You're like, what are you doing, dude? You can't you can't <laughs> just go jump the ship and do something so radically different. This that's new order's point. been around 30 years. They're kind of completely antithetical to our aristocratic life. Um, and, and even, already- even if you think of it just from a religious order point of view, like if you had a brother today or a son who joined the Dominicans, you'd be rather proud of that. But in the 13th century, this was like a weird group that you wouldn't necessarily be happy. You'd be happy that your son's into religion and stuff and love Jesus maybe, but you'd be like, dude, this is weird. Like you, it'd be the equivalent of these Franciscans who don't wear shoes. They, they hitchhike everywhere. You're like, I don't know. This just seems they wear the tonsure, you know? So his mom yeah. was... Yeah, you go. So I'm I'm already I'm already experiencing, you know, just kind of firsthand just listening to the life of Thomas Aquinas and most of religious uh, affiliation to a different order, it de- it develops through relationship and he was around the Benedictines. He was in Monte Cassino and now seeing these kind of revolutionary orders in relatively recent history, the mendicants, you know, what was it that for Thomas Aquinas that really kind of tipped him in the direction of joining the Dominican order. We know that he was a prayerful person, but this is kind of out of the norm for him and and what kind of the expectations surrounding his life that he would actually take that step. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, he doesn't have the sort of, he doesn't seem to have had the same sort of enthusiastic personality of St. Francis who would like run after this new thing. Um, Obvious, I, I think even at that time, there was a difference in the way the Dominicans and the Franciscans were practicing um, poverty. Um, but but I don't know, actually, it's a really good question. Maybe he just saw the influence that the Dominicans could have on the church and the most respected sort of scientist in the West at that time was St. Albert, the great, who was a Dominican who ended up becoming his tutor. Um, so that those may have been a few reasons. One One of the the Latin phrases, one of the Latin phrases that I, that one of the Latin phrases that I love is Ecclesia Semper Reformandum Est. Mm -hmm. And the church is in a constant state of reform. And you have like these reformers that that come up through the ranks of of evangelization, and they bring such a charismatic response to the renewal effort. And I mean, where would we be without an Augustine? Where would we be without Aquinas? Where Mm -hmm. would we be without these really these uh, revolution? Yeah, Yeah, Teresa of Avila, you know, the renewal of of the Carmelite order. And I think, you know, when when it comes down to prayer and recognition of like you were mentioning, you know, the Albigensian uh, heresy, when you're seeing that firsthand and the need of Holy Mother Church spurred on by the spirit of mysticism and, and really being encouraged to go out into you know, a, a kind of uncharted territory, you know, I could kind of see that developing in, in St. Thomas Aquinas's response to the need for the church to reform. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I had read about Aquinas is that he had fallen under the kind of the influence of a really excellent Dominican preacher, John of St. Julian. So when Aquinas was in between his studies in Southern Italy, um, he encountered this preacher and this preacher was just on fire and it really stirred something in him. And it really radically changed the course of his discernment to where it had been a presupposition that he had been a Benedictine, but then encountering John of St. Julien, 
and this new kind of preaching, this new kind of maybe thought that was maybe more in line with where his discernment was going through, you know, Aristotelian principles or more a, um, you know, structured kind of thinking might have really appealed to him. Now, I haven't read enough into it to know the exact the exact nature of it, but that is typically given as the, the, the nexus and the turning point where he went away from his discernment towards the Dominicans. And I always think like for the, for the Benedictines, it's like Thomas Aquinas getting away to the Dominicans is like the Boston Red Sox selling Babe Ruth. Like that's the one that really got away from their roster. You know, that could have been a retired Jersey for them. That is cool. That's a so, great contribution. So when he did end up leaving, he's about 19 years old. Uh, Matt, why don't you tell us kind of how his family reacted to, his, to that news that he was not kind of following the plan for they had they had for him? Well, I think his father had passed away by then, uh, but his brothers were in the military. And so his mothers actually sent his brother to sort of capture him as he was on a journey, um, brought him back to the family castle in Rocaseca. Sometimes it's kind of made to seem as if he was in a deep, dark dungeon, but uh, I'm, led to, I'm led to believe that isn't the case. He was, it was more under house arrest, as it were. He could take visitors and, and perhaps come and go, but he was required to sort of stay at home. And he was there for about a year or two, and during that time memorized a great deal of Holy Scripture, um, had different translations of Aristotle that he was reading, and never lost his resolve to become a Dominican. Uh, there's the famous story. Uh, and, and it seems to be true. You know, sometimes you'll hear these cute or sensational stories about the saints and you go, I don't know if that's really true. Maybe that's just something that's kind of developed over time. But this does seem to be in some of the earliest biographies that we have of him that his brothers sent in a prostitute into his chambers in the middle of the night to sort of seduce him. We can only speculate as to why. Maybe it was to dissuade him from his religious vocation. Maybe it was out of, out of a sort of jealousy, seeing the sort of chaste heart that he had that they didn't. Uh, but he is said to have wasted no time in resisting the prostitute. He ran over to the fire, pulled out a burning iron and chased her out of the door with it. So there you go. I don't know if Jason Everett has ever suggested that in a chastity talk, but that's what Aquinas did. And, that's a pretty um, extreme, ex extreme thing. I think Jason yeah. might uh, be a little bit more uh, level headed than that. Um, during, <laughs> during that actual encounter, after he chased him away, well, according to legend, uh, two angels came and comforted him and kind of, you know, told him what a good job he had done in protecting his chastity and gave him a, a girdle as a sign of his chastity. And that girdle still exists. It's a, a relic. It's in some church, I believe, in Italy somewhere. So, like, mm. the holy sign of Jason Everett-style chastity, uh, maybe not burnt on fire, but it's still around. So that's a pretty interesting story about his brothers hiring him a prostitute. Mm. Really it, and, and it was about a year, uh, as I say, or two, and at which point we believe you know, his mum just sort of let him go. Um, there's, there's, there, one theory I read was that maybe she let him go at night so as to save face and just sort of say, well, Aquinas sort of escaped. Um, but anyway, there you go. Yeah, his mother, oh, yeah. instead of saying, yeah, we're letting you go join this crazy new hippie wild hair movement of the Dominicans, he broke out. We didn't condone that, but he broke out. What can That's we a do? possibility, yeah. yeah. He was mother of Theodora. That's right. That's right. So he takes off, breaks out of the castle, fights off prostitutes with flaming swords, <laughs> got a sweet girdle on, and he's down the road now and... All this turmoil, where does that lead him? That leads him into the sermon with the Dominicans and then ultimately into um, becoming a student. And I think that's a really formative part of his life that can really shine some light on who Aquinas was and who he became. Right. And so, yeah, so my understanding is that, uh, as we've already mentioned, um, uh, what's his name? I just lost it. Uh, Albert the Great, sorry, was, was his one of his teachers, at least there's, there's some, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but uh, it's either at Monte Cassino or later on in his studies. Sometimes you'll hear two different versions. So I'm not sure which to take or if either are true, but uh, his fellow students re realizing that he was really quiet and a big man uh, said something to the effect of, you know, you're a, you're a dumb ox or you're like a dumb ox. And Albert is said to have said, you call him a dumb ox, but I tell you that one day his bellowing will be, uh, heard throughout the world. 
so he ends up being ordained a priest and ends up teaching at the University of Paris. And his his title was uh, Master of the Sacred Page. So he was a he was a biblical scholar. That was his primary primary work. You know, talking about him being a dumb ox, I think a lot of people get the impression that, well, because of the way that we use the word dumb in modern sense is unintelligent or stupid. But if you've ever heard the term, you know, deaf, dumb and blind, dumb typically means or originally meant that you didn't have the ability to speak. So Aquinas was either very quiet, but never Mm -hmm. was that, that the dumb ox portion of that was never meant to say, you know, he's a unintelligent beast of burden really is that he was quiet and didn't have a lot to say. So kind of understanding that really helps you understand what they were saying about him, what his temperament was. Um, What I love about this is that it shows that we are always on a journey and the catechism expresses about the humanity, human life is in statu vie. It's in a state of journeying. And, you know, von Balthasar expressed it in the sense of in a state of becoming. And we're seeing that becoming in Thomas Aquinas in a beautiful way on his journey of life. And I think applying that even in our own life or the church's life and the history of the church is that, you know, we are in need of reform. We are in need of being directed and influenced and and responding to the time. So you were mentioning before, Matt, that Aristotle was really kind of uh, causing a lot of conflict within the church because of a retranslation or a new translation that was coming out. You have heresies, uh, you know, going on and, and this is really separating the church, dividing the church. So how did it start to crystallize in, in Thomas Aquinas's life where he started taking more of an advanced step in relationship to lifting up his voice and actually saying something and integrating Aristotle in his theology? Yeah. So, um, as is commonly said, you know, prior to Aquinas, Plato was usually the uh, Greek philosopher that Christians turned to to help them make sense of kind of reconciling faith and reason. And this made sense. You know, you read Plato, it's very mystical. He speaks of the heavens and things like this. Whereas um, we had some translations of Aristotle, like I think Boethius translated his work on logic. We had some other things, but as others started to come from the Islamic world that were translated uh, through through the through Muslims actually um one of the couple of things that he held were were were, were kind of contrary right to the to the Christian faith so one of those things is the idea that a quite uh, Aristotle had several arguments as to why the universe never began to exist for example you know now that's problematic and he had some other things that were problematic and so the University of Paris banned the teaching of Aristotle on multiple occasions. Um, and nevertheless, Aquinas realized that he was a genius and so was able to sort of reconcile faith and philosophy through through the works of primarily Aristotle. When you look at the Summa Theologiae, which is Aquinas' most common work or famous work, if you look at who he quotes in order, he quotes Holy Scripture first, he quotes St. Augustine second, and he quotes Aristotle, who he calls the philosopher third. I think that's kind of a good way of thinking of Aquinas' emphasis. First and foremost, he's a biblical scholar. Uh, second, of course, he's a, he's a Catholic. And so um, referring to the most prominent theologian of the time, uh, or prom- the man who was read the most, the theologian who was read the most, consorted the most, Augustine, and then, and then Aristotle. So, yeah, it's... Uh, there was there was a lot of kind of stuff going on around that time. Like there were these there was this a translator of Aristotle by the name of Averroes, and then after him you've got some uh, uh, what were referred to as Latin Averroists, those who followed Averroes, and these Latin Averroists were making certain claims like uh, there are truths to philosophy and there are truths to religion, and even though they may contradict, they can still both be true. Uh, C. J. of Brabant was one of these people who seems to have said. I agree with Aristotle when he proves that the universe is eternal because I'm a philosopher and I agree with Genesis when it says the universe is not eternal. Uh, So Aquinas had some really blistering words to say against such people. It's interesting because as I say, as we said earlier, you read Aquinas and he does tend to sound, he writes in syllogisms very dispassionately, but there are a few times when he's responding to people like like the, the the Latin Averroists and others that you see, wow, he 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 uh, he had some fire within him as well. So a lot of his a lot of his academic work was 
fueled by not just discovering the truth himself, but also um, uh, displaying that to others in that particular time in a particular way. Would you say that's a fair statement? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, another thing that's so beautiful about Aquinas and is, is how patristic he was. So I actually have in front of me this work called the Cantana Aurea. You may have heard of it. It's a, it, this is just, this is the St. Luke, the volume of St. Luke. Basically, uh, this is a, a commentary on the scriptures. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, but for those who aren't, where Aquinas takes the texts of the church fathers. And so it's a commentary on the gospels with only the texts of the church fathers. Wow. So like, for example, in uh, John, it'll say, you know, um, in the beginning was the word. And then you've got like five pages of commentary from all, you know, all the early church fathers that he had access to. So there's no, no words of his own in this. It only comes from the church. And you can imagine like today, that would be a daunting task, you know, like going through Google and trying to get all these things. Well, he had to go, I think, to the Vatican archives and, 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 and to, to kind of get access to these things that weren't easily available. And uh, so, so yeah, yeah. So very, very patristic as well, which I think is kind of like, and a kind of olive branch to our Orthodox brothers and sisters who sometimes look with skepticism upon Thomas Aquinas, uh, the fact that he was so, you know, concerned with what the church fathers taught. You know, another thing with Aquinas is that he didn't just, you know, he, he would be patristic in the church fathers. He would look at Greek philosophers, but he would also look at Islamic and Jewish philosophers and sources as well. Uh, he really was pursuing truth where it could be found or at least techniques and, and, arguments. Um, can you speak to some of those uh, influences as well of Aquinas? So he seems to have uh, some degree of respect for Maimon Maimonides, uh, the, the Jewish philosopher, but he has- I just wanted you to pronounce that because I've read it a million times and <laughs> have no idea how to say it. So I wasn't saying Maimonides, but I'm like, uh, but he, I don't want to look stupid in front of Matt. So. But it, it, he seems to have had zero respect for Muhammad. And if you read what he has to say about Muhammad, it is it would get you kicked off YouTube today. Let's just put it that way. Uh, he's a bloody a bandit. Uh, and the only reason he was able to spread this Christian heresy, which is what Muhammadism was thought to be at the time, and I think still is, should, should mm -hmm. be, um, you know, says, well, you, you, you're dealing with a bunch of idiot people who are willing to kind of buy this nonsense that you were spouting. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Uh, one thing I think we can learn from Aquinas, which is, pretty great. Like you read the Summa Theologiae, right? This was a work that was originally written for kind of beginning theology students, but he has another work called the Summa Contra Gentiles or a summary against the Gentiles in which this was a work of apologetics that was meant to help Christians respond and missionaries respond to the claims and objections of Jews and Muslims. I find the Summa Contra Gentiles a lot more interesting because it is very apologetic in nature, which makes it fun. But he also very often doesn't quote scripture because you're dealing with Muslims and Jews, which is like, you know, just a good idea. Like if I'm arguing with a Muslim or an atheist or a Jew, quoting scripture, you know, might be convincing to me, but it's not convincing to them. So in order to be effective, you want to kind of, you want to kind of start your arguments from different kind of axioms. So that's, I think that's really interesting too. Yeah, and you mentioned um, earlier, too, that he was also, he would write hymns. Um, and some of those hymns are ones that we still yeah. sing today. And, you know, you don't really consider Aquinas the musician, Aquinas the songwriter. You think, oh, he's, you know, this nerd in a book and Santa Sabina cruising around a circle, you know, uh, dictating, you know, these syllogisms. But he was actually this this deep mystic as well. Um some of the most of beautiful that? hymns, yeah, the beautiful hymns of the of the history of the church, like Panis Angelicus. How often do we hear that? Mm. I mean, and and it's and it's catechetical in nature. And I think I think seeing Aristotle's treatment on politics and how important music is in relationship to culture and society and mankind being ordered toward the polis and how you nurture community, you know, I, I have to imagine that that had to play a part in it, and then that he really entered in just shared such catechetical beautiful works and poetry uh, yeah i'm really interested to hear more about that too yeah well i mean i, I don't know i know some things but not a great deal pope urban the fourth instituted the feast of corpus christi and when he did he looked to these different theologians to write hymns for that feast uh, Aquinas wrote several, as we know, uh, as did 
uh, St. Bonaventure, who was a Franciscan contemporary, actually died the same year mm. uh, as Aquinas. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't actually looked into the authenticity of this, but I'm not sure why it wouldn't be true. Apparently, uh, Aquinas and Bonaventure were together um, kind of going over these hymns with, with Pope Urban IV. And Aquinas went first and was sharing these hymns. And as he did, it said that Bonaventure tore up what he had written because he was so moved by what Aquinas had written. Oh, beautiful, uh, man. Wow. I- yeah. I mean, I kind of hope that's not true because I'd like to have access to them. I'm sure right. what he wrote yeah. was beautiful, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty beautiful. So, yeah, when you read uh, his his hymns, I'm trying to think like Osalataris would be, be one. And what else would there be? You already mentioned um, Panis Angelicus. Tentum Ergo, that's kind of one that's yep. usually sung. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Lovely. And the hierarchy yeah. of the angels, how he kind of touched on the hierarchy and, and, yeah. and shared that catechetically. I mean, brilliant man to get it into the fabric of our culture as yeah. as Catholics. And, you know, when we're when we're in need of the reform of today, you know, we need music that that catechetically instructs our people in a beautiful way. And Tom, yeah. Thomas Aquinas is a great example of that. What how we should approach writing uh, modern music in the church. I just well, looked up. I just looked up real quick here. Pungwe, Pungwe lingua, or tantum ergos, is also called. Mm-hmm. I just listened to this first stanza. Hail our Savior's glorious body, which His Virgin Mother bore. Hail the blood which shed for sinners, did a broken world restore. Hail the sacrament most holy, holy flesh and blood of Christ adore. I won't bore us by going on. Maybe not bore us, but I won't. I won't bloviate. But my goodness gracious! Yeah, all right, here we go. No, <laughs> I won't do that. I'll spare you that. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's some amazing things and I'll put some links um, on the page here to some YouTube videos of some of these, so you can get an understanding of, uh, of those songs and hymns that he wrote. Um, another one of my favorite things about Aquinas is his handwriting was legendarily bad. I've heard I, I that. Can't, I can't remember the term, but it's essentially like the horrible writing was the way his handwriting was. Um, described and there's some examples of his writing still exist and and if you think um, if his theology alone didn't earn him the title of doctor of the church his writing certainly did because he <laughs> wrote like a doctor very good and yeah, I've I've heard it I haven't seen it if you if you uh, have access to it send 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 it over to me I'd love to see it I'll, I'll send you a picture of it it's it's yeah. like <laughs> it's in Latin and it's just it's literally it looks like this I mean it's that bad. Yeah. So that's why he would rely on secretaries. And according to you know a lot of accounts, he yeah. would just go around the courtyard of the monastery, just in circles, thinking, talking. And he would be dictating to more than one secretary at a time. He'd be like, that's write that, blah, 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 blah. And then he'd be saying it to the other one. While, while this one's writing it down, he'd be gone to the next thought over yes, here. Yes, that's right. As, uh, I know one that's of them brother, brother Reginald. Um, that's right. Was like really his primary secretary. And without him, you know, we'd have all these great high minded thoughts and all this uh, systematic theology completely unintelligible. So it's. Well, and for more than just that reason, here's something really cool about apparently Brother Reginald one day approached Aquinas, who famously never completed the Summa Theologiae, but we can get into that if you want. Um, but he asked Aquinas to write a simpler version of the Summa. And he did. So I forget what it's called, the light of faith. It's sometimes called different things. But there's a work of Thomas Aquinas. It's not somebody who dumbed it down for us. Aquinas dumbed his own Summa down for us. It, so I, my understanding is it was Brother Reginald's insistence that led to that as well. Yeah, Reginald's like, hey, man, you, you got to pump the Dude. brakes here, Tommy. This Dude. is getting a bit much. <laughs> like, I get it. This is great. But this is kind of, you know, this is your four album prog rock. <laughs> like, let's get some hits out there for people first to get some buy-in. <laughs> yeah, that's um, funny. Hey, hey, why, you did, you, uh, why did Thomas Aquinas uh, choose to write in the form that he did in the Summa? Is that Was that a popular style of writing? Could you explain the style and then maybe a little uh, – um, a little bit about why he chose to write it in that manner. So my understanding is during that time, there were debates that took place at universities, uh, which were called, well, disputed questions. Okay. And so there was sort of a, a question that was to be debated. And uh, I, before responding to you, had to summarize your objections or your, your positive case for this question 
before I could respond to you. Now, can you imagine how differently a presidential debate would go if prior to responding, let's pick on Hillary and Trump, you know, back in the day, if Trump had to ask, had to explain had to reiterate what Hillary's point was to her satisfaction before responding. I mean, maybe it would be more boring, but it would certainly be a heck of a lot more substantive, substantive. you know, so true. really interesting, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing. And so in, in, so in the Zoom, you got this question and then you'll see several objections to the position he wants to make. Then you have what's called a said contra. And in that, that's where Aquinas basically appeals to authority, the authority of Augustine or the Bible usually, in responding to these arguments. And then he has his main response called the respondio. And after that, all of his responses to the objections made. So when you read an article of the Summa, it's like reading a prepackaged debate. So it's actually, you know, once you can kind of understand what he's doing, I find it really, really a uh, yeah, yeah, fun way of reading. I can't think of how many people reach out to us and they say, you know, how do I respond to this, you know, my cousin or my mother or whatever, how do I respond to that? We get that a lot. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to answer them and and, because the questions sometimes aren't really posed properly. So it's kind of interesting that you're saying, okay, well, what is the, what is the point? Because sometimes we will get it and I'll say, well, what are exactly are you talking about here? I mean, there's several different layers to this. Yeah. And I have I haven't listened to your argument. So Yeah, yeah. It kind of makes sense that they would That's a good point. That. that is a good point, isn't it? Because, you know, when usually when somebody believes something, they don't just believe it for one reason, they believe it for multiple reasons. And so sometimes you can be responding to a reason someone might have to hold this particular view, but it's not actually their reason. And over here on my shelf I have a work of his called De Malo, right, uh, on evil. Now, in the Summa Theologiae, sometimes he'll come up with as many as tw- uh, 12. That's probably the, the most I've seen objections to the point he wants to make. But in this work, let me see here if I can find it. So, he has sometimes as many as 20, 20 plus arguments. Can you imagine that? Like he comes up with 20 plus objections to the point he wants to make makes the point, then responds to the 20 plus objections. I mean, that's remarkable. If I, if I was to say to you, give me, give me five reasons why someone might be pro-abortion and don't make them sound stupid. I don't know if we'd be able to do that so well, or maybe if we're very thoughtful, intelligent, and we've kind of interacted with people, we might be able to, because that was the other thing. Like when you read Aquinas, he doesn't straw man his opponent's arguments, right? Which mm. is a sort of fallacy in, in which I misrepresent you in order to just take you down, take your position down. He, he does, instead of straw manning, he does what's sometimes called steel manning. He makes your arguments even better than you could and then responds to them. And sometimes you'll read Aquinas and you'll read these objections and you know he's going to respond to them, but you think to yourself, I don't know how he's going to get out of this one. This one seems pretty <laughs> solid. Yeah, and, is- and the fact that he's, he's re- recording several of them um, it's almost like responding to something vague as how do I respond to this? And you're saying, okay, well, they could mean this, 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 and this. Let me kind of frame the whole thing for you before I even respond. Because a lot of arguments these days, you know, like you were mentioning with the debates is just talking over people. And there's no real debate there. There's no real inquiry, if you will, right? There's no inquiry as to how do we find the truth in this matter? It's merely just people just throwing rocks at each other and using this particular yeah. instance as, as something to do that. We live in a tragic time after in respect to our social media world and how much of our conversations are just statements. The death of dialogue. Oh, yeah. I, I'm is, a jerk. A, I'm a oh. jerk on social media. Like that's why I don't run it. I have somebody else run it now because I can't be trusted with it. I just end up slam dunking on people instead of being <laughs> at all interested in what they want to say. Right. Like, and that, that, I mean, if we had the self-control, this would be good advice. Now to those watching, you don't have this self-control. So this advice is essentially useless because you're an idiot. <laughs> but if you weren't an idiot, here's some advice you could take, right? When somebody says something you disagree with, Ask them to clarify what they mean and try and do that one or two different times. Like when you say this, do you mean this? Or by that, did you mean that before responding? Now you won't do that probably because you're not a saint, but it would be good if you did. It would be good if I did. Uh, It might be easier just to quit social media, but it seems like Twitter especially is, is sort of created in order to 
well, as one Dominican friar put it to me, humility rarely goes viral. And so instead you just have people kind of quote tweeting people, which is essentially like, you know, the, 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 the social media equivalent of dunking on somebody, it seems. Yeah, there's very with, with little that can be, that can be, do you like Explain that I do, well do you like on social that I, media? Sorry, do you like that I was I just it just occurred to me that I was trying to tell people to be charitable and I called them idiots. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Good. Well, good. Keep know, going. It's that clarity we were talking about. <laughs> Stupidity too is a gift from God. It just shouldn't be overused. Uh, John Paul too. Um, but yeah, on social media, people will come onto our channel or just whomever and they'll say, well, what do you think of this argument? And they'll just throw out these arguments and they expect you to respond. And if you don't really engage with them, they consider it a win. There is no way social media is a, is a platform that you can have a really intelligent discussion that you can ever get to the heart of man. You're not, you're not changing people's minds. You're not going to go on there and be like, oh, well, hey, check out this link from Catholic Answers or from Pints with Aquinas and boom. Well, they're all of a sudden converted. It just doesn't work yeah. like that. The best thing you can do on social media is is be an example of grace, be an example of charity and virtue and your actions on there. Those are the only things that really that platform could even do a remotely decent job of transmitting. Definitely not any sort of structured debate or any sort of real conversation. Those things need to happen in person, in a book or in a form yeah, like totally. this where there's more of a hundred percent. I think people, and there's I mean, a great place yeah. though for you, seriously, a great place for you to go online on social media right now for those exactly. charitable tweets and posts. And that's to the Catholic talk show. <laughs> so we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Make sure that you're hitting all of those places and following as well as YouTube. Most important uh, thing to do right now is click the subscribe button, click the bell. And then every time we have a show, it populates and notifies you so do, you don't miss any content. And some, you know, the, I think the hope that I have in modern transmission of media is in podcasting, the podcast forum, something that that you, Matt, do tremendously well. You're, you're, you're at the forefront of the Catholic world and having very intelligent conversations that influence people to think. And, you know, when, when you see podcasting, it creates a setting where conversation and dialogue can be possible. Social media in many respects have kind of deafened the ability of having dialogue. And the death of dialogue is something that we are suffering in the public square. But I think podcasting has a potential of guiding us into a deeper, more intentional, thoughtful conversation. And I'd love to hear more about what you do with Pints with Aquinas, because it is just such an attractive uh, one name of a podcast. But the substance that you bring into it is, is very, very interesting. Well, thank you. I hope so. Uh, Pines with Aquinas has been ha happening pre-Trump. I mean, five years now. It's crazy. Um, started off just as an audio podcast. And then about a year or two ago, we started introducing video. And now it's both. Um, and it's not terribly ori original. It's... Um, but we we tend to we want to have discussions with intelligent, thoughtful people who know how to have conversations. Um, so a lot of the time we'll do kind of in-person interviews. I've got a brand new studio I built here in Steubenville, Ohio. So a lot of you know, there's no shortage of excellent, intelligent folks to sit down and have a good chat with. And the room is set up in such a way that it's kind of a comfortable room. People can have a drink, they can have a smoke. We have even cigar air purifiers in the room so that people can just kind of relax and have a good chat. Um, and so we try to talk about things that pertain to the faith and uh, try to think about them through a Thomistic lens. We also host debates on the channel. So Love just last those. week, we had Trent Horn debate Matt, Matt, uh, Matt Dillahunty, who's a quite a prominent atheist online, debating the reasonableness of the resurrection. We have others coming up as well. Um, and it's been real fun. It's been real fun. Yeah. And I'll put some links to uh, Matt's website, to his podcast and to his YouTube channel. Really check them out. There is some great content. I mean, from his interviews to the debates. I mean, uh, look, when we started this out, we're like, hey, we want to be Matt Fred when we grew up. So, uh, you know, really, you, you've done a great job with it. Well, thank I'm, you. Uh, I got a great marketing other... company that helps me continue. I asked my wife if I can put a cigar purifier in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried that, actually. Uh, it's funny you should say that. I tried doing that in my own house. How'd it go? Remember, 
<laughs> they, I, I, I put, just put the kids to bed. I walked down to my basement. I had the cigar purifier. She knew about it, right? But I guess like one of the kids wasn't going to bed. And so she was kind of stressed out. And here I am downstairs having this smoke and the smoke's going through <laughs> the, the ceiling into like the pantry. So she came down, not a happy camper. <laughs> Let's See, just you say needed that. to pull the Aquinas on it. You needed to go to Mystic. So what you're saying is that the smoke comes upstairs and it causes a disruption. Right? <laughs> Said contra. Like, you've got yeah. you to practice what you <laughs> preach, Matt. <laughs> um, no, I can't quick, beat I did my want wife to mention it. argument. <laughs> why, I wanted to mention why we're talking about Pints of the Quinas before we get back into the last couple of points. But um, you have a really great ebook on your website, uh, pintsofthequinas.com. And it's you can understand Aquinas. And it's a way for people who are maybe – intimidated by the summa or have looked at these and, and looked at this kind of debate format and aren't really sure how to make sense of it. This is a way for you to get introduced to Aquinas and to really start being enveloped in the way that his mind works and the way systematic theology works. Uh, it's free. I'll put the link right on, on here in the Thanks. comments and on our website, go and download that. And then you'll get all kinds of, you know, information about when Matt's releasing a podcast too, but that book is a great place to start. If you know, if you're not ready for the shorter summa that Brother Reginald told Thomas Aquinas to wrote, this is maybe that stepping point to that. So go check that out there. Good yeah, thank you. Now, you had mentioned, and I want to get back into it, is that Aquinas never finished the summa. Um, and that's a really kind of pivotal moment <clears throat> in his life, in the history of the church, and that this great work, this the sum of all theology, isn't really a sum. It's missing the latter half. And there's some pretty interesting reasons as why. Would you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah. So there are kind of th th three parts to the Summa. You got the, it's actually called the first part, second part, third part. If you want to sound fancy, you say in Latin, prima pars, you know, secunde, and then you have the second part of the second part. It's very unoriginal. Anyway. Uh, but then anyway, so we'll get to that. So Aquinas, it was, I think December 6th, which was the feast of St. Nicholas. Um, again, there are different accounts of how this happened, but one of them is that after mass, he was meditating before the blessed sacrament and praying and brother Reginald overheard a conversation allegedly took place between Christ and Thomas Aquinas. And our Lord uh, apparently said to Thomas, you've written well of me, Thomas, what would you have as your reward? Now I would have said like a, a Jeep and a trip to Russia, but <laughs> Aquinas said, uh, non nisite domine, which is Latin, they tell me, for nothing if not you, Lord, which is a great answer. Like, I'll have all of it, or I'll have none of it, or I'll have some of it, so long as I have you with it. Um, beautiful thing. And apparently after that uh, encounter, Aquinas stopped writing. He, he kind of laid down his quill, and that was it. And Brother Reginald really pressed him to continue writing, and he's said to have said in response, after what I have seen... Uh, all I have written seems to me to be nothing but straw. Now, if I was Brother Reginald, I think I would have said, well, that's might be all good and well, but after what I've seen, it's still pretty bloody magnificent. So if you could just find it within yourself to keep cracking on with this bad boy. Or like, why did you tell me to write this in the first place? <laughs> You're going to stop halfway through. Come on, man. I've been working on this, following you around with your terrible hand for five of years. <laughs> Kill me. Yeah. Yeah. So... But what, what happened, so he didn't write anymore, but um, there's this, it's called the supplemental section of the Summa where the questions are rounded out and you might be afraid and you think, oh gosh, does that mean Brother Reginald wrote his answers for him to finish it or who, who, who completed it? Well, it actually was Aquinas' uh, writings just from a different time period. So Brother Reginald kind of went back and found different writings of Aquinas to, to, to supplement it, to finish off the Summa. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's said that he kind of became really kind of quiet and, and reflective, uh, especially after that. And on a, on the way to a church council, he became ill, uh, different accounts as to how that may have happened. And he was originally taken to his sister's house, but wanted to die in a religious house. And so was taken to the Cistercian monastery. And while he was there, they asked him if he would kindly narrate for them a commentary on the Song of Songs. So not only, not even in death could he find some peace. Um, so he said to have done that, though to my understanding, we don't have that anywhere. I Wouldn't that be lovely to get that one day? Oh, yeah. Um, and he, now, he, he died there. I've read a few things about his death, and uh, one of them is that really when he was riding his horse, uh, he hit his head on a tree branch, and that ultimately 
you know, led to his death, which I always thought was kind of interesting that a brain injury, you know, mm. would lead to the death of this mind. And then also that he had been poisoned. So if you read Dante, Dante says that he was actually poisoned. Oh, interesting. And yeah, and it's in Dante, and he was poisoned. I can't remember who, uh, maybe like the Duke of Savoy or something along those lines. Um, and I'll look for that, and I'll send it to you, Matt. But thanks. It was a pretty widely, at least, held up theory that he actually died of poisoning. And one other interesting thing that I, I did read about it is that <laughs> on the way to this council in Rome, he one of the places that he had to stop because he was sick was Monte Cassino. So, and this whole winding oh, you know, life of his after getting this head injury he ended up having to go to monte casino again where it all started for him and then went to that cistercian monastery where he ultimately died so he went to monte casino recovered enough to try to keep going oh, that but then right? died there. wow yeah and oh, that's interesting and, i mean it could be you know there's various accounts of everything from those times but um to me that was a lot of poetic continuity yeah. in those in those elements of the story yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd mentioned Brother Reginald coming in and, and hearing that vision. Chesterton talks about, and mm -hmm. this is in tradition as well, that um, Aquinas would levitate. Aquinas would levitate when he was in the middle of these ecstasies, that he was so you know, enraptured with his devotional love for Christ and the cross that People would come into the chapel and he'd just be floating around just off of his feet. And that this, uh, you know, all a straw encounter happened in the same manner that he was floating around the chapel like a like a feather. Yeah, I don't know how much of that is true, but um, yeah, there's definitely different accounts of that. It's, you know, you always want to be careful, don't you? Especially if you've got kind of competing accounts of something. Um, but yeah, the Lord, you know, God raised Jesus from the dead. So I'm sure he could have done that too. Mm -hmm. And I and I think you know you know to color that in with a, with an appropriate treatment would be that Aquinas you know yes he's an intellectual giant you know he's he's a doctor of the church you know and yes he should be held up as as one of those intellectual contributors but there's other facets of this man in history that we can really develop a, a good solid treatment of and his mystical life, his prayer life and his intimacy with Christ was what drove his intellectual pursuit. And to see a more holistic treatment of somebody that could possibly be held up as an indulgent man because of his, his uh, prowess and, and his, uh, his kind of domineering nature um, clearly he has a domineering intellect. I could just picture him as, as y'all were sharing, you know, pointing at different people. Okay. You take this down, you take this down. And, and he's operating at such a high speed and high level of deposit. But, you know, to see that that is, it's a full treatment of him. No, he was a very, he was a very ascetical man. He was a very disciplined man. He was disciplined in prayer and he was disciplined in executing uh, you know, these beautiful treatments of his Summa Theologica, De Malo, and these hymns. What a, what a great kind of synopsis of the doctor of grace, you know, mm. the doc, the angelic doctor, uh, you know, a doctor of grace is St. Augustine, the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Matt, for being on the show, brother. Yeah, thank you. I, I would say, you know, like I'm, I'm in no way, shape or form an academic. I consider myself a studious amateur. But if people were interested in kind of reading a more academic biography, I would uh, point them to uh, Jean-Pierre Terrell's, I think it's a two volume set on Thomas Aquinas. He's a French Dominican. And it's generally considered to be like the best uh, and most accurate sort of uh, biography of Thomas Aquinas's. Mm. And as an so, introduction, people were able to get to know you a little bit, Matt. So how can people get in touch with you? To, because you're, you know, you're in a lot of different forms, not only with Pints with Aquinas, but, you know, you're really, you're really out in, in the public square of the Catholic Church and doing a lot of different things. I saw recently, just last night, a book you did with Jason Everett. Oh, yeah. um, so how can, how can people find out the uh, materials that you put out there and, and get to know you even better? Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Pintswithaquinas.com is, is the number one place to go to for all that stuff. They can always type my last name into Amazon and find all the books there or 
it would be better not to shop from Amazon, let's be honest. So going to a local <laughs> Catholic bookstore or, you know, buying it somewhere else would probably be way far more preferable. But yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And I'll put links to all of that. I'll put links to that free ebook uh, from Matt's website uh, that you can understand Aquinas ebook. Um, you know, if if you, chances are you've seen Matt stuff if you're watching us, right? But if you've only watched us and not him, I don't know, imagine how that's possible. <laughs> go subscribe to him, go support him on Patreon. Um, there's a lot of great courses that you can only get of Matt's on Patreon. Really awesome stuff too. Um, exclusive like courses and stuff. So look, if you've only got one person that you can support right now, look, we love all this, all of our patrons. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic talk show if you want to support us. But look, if it's down between us and Matt, you know, for this episode only, go over and check out Matt on Patreon. He really, I, I agree. I agree with yeah. that. That's <laughs> a, very well put. Well, don't make me respond to that on social media. I won't be so kind, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, Ryan, and Brian, it's it's a joy to be with you today. Matt, thank you so much for your time sure. and your energy and your love for St. Thomas Aquinas. We hope that our viewers and our listeners enjoy getting to know St. Thomas Aquinas and applying some of his teachings, get to know him today. There's a lot that you could apply into your daily life that he teaches some very practical words of wisdom and to help you come to a greater understanding. Fetus quarens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. Uh, he's a phenomenal example of that. Thank you to our patrons that make this possible, you know, that our show can continue on and have great content just like this. But before we go, we need to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our number one sponsor and the number one Catholic app in the App Store, Hallow. Hallow is a phenomenal prayer app, great meditations, journaling efforts, Bible in a year with Mike Schmitz, which clearly I am no Mike Schmitz. No Mike and Schmitz. I know Ryan Delacross. I mean, he loves Hallow and uses it every day. Ryan, give a word to Hallow, my brother. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I think a lot of people struggle with prayer. I know I do. I still do. And uh, Hallow is a great guided meditation. You literally just turn it on and you listen and you got, you be, you're you guided to a meditation with our Lord and it's beautiful. I use it with my kids when we're driving. Uh, it's just a great thing to do if you struggle with prayer. Uh, it's guided meditations and they're beautiful and it does bring you closer to the Lord. And, and I can't imagine um, a life without it right now. Honestly, it's just a really tremendous app. Yeah, now, if you throughout go to COVID, show dot com forward slash hollow, you can get the app for free. So I'll make sure that that links there as well. So if you want it free, CatholicTalkShow dot com forward slash hollow. Now, throughout COVID, you all saw Ryan Shields' hair grow here and here, up top and below his chin. He looked uh -huh. like a woodsman. And we have an awesome sponsor that Shields going to tell you all about. But now, <laughs> you, you know, you're looking pretty trim over there, my brother. It, it was it was embarrassing not only to my family but to myself at that point. Um, I looked like a, <laughs> yeah, I looked like I just came in right from the wild, probably bugs and stuff. Dude, like I'd be eating and like my beard would get in my mouth. It was just it was terrible. Um, what a great way to talk about our sponsors. <laughs> but our other sponsor definitely takes greater care in the things that they do because it is all handcrafted, beautiful sacramentals. And that's the Catholic Woodworker. The Catholic Woodworker provides amazing handcrafted and, and heirloom quality rosaries and uh, devotionals and home altars. Um, these are all made in America by hand. If you go to catholicwoodworker.com, they'll show you how you can select what kind of wood you want, what kind of metals and materials, so that the things that you're using to elevate your prayer life and to focus your prayer life really are worthy of the pursuit. Um, if you don't have a home altar, this is a great way to start to bring that devotion to your home. And these home altars really are beautiful. It's something that you'd be proud to have in your home. You'd be proud to show people because it's high quality, but it's also a place for in your own internal you know, space to focus your worship to the Trinity. Again, catholicwoodworker.com. Uh, really beautiful handcrafted things. Go check them out now. I'll put the link there. But if you're looking for a rosary or home altar, that is the place to go. Now, uh, again, shout out to all of our patrons. We really appreciate it. Um, if you're considering or if, you, if you're if you already a, a patron of ours and you got a little bit more to give, definitely go check out Matt. Uh, I'll put the link to his Patreon as well. If, if it's between the two of us for this episode, like I said, 
go ahead and check out Matt first because he's got some really, really great courses and exclusive content on his Patreon that you really wouldn't want to miss and uh, really help you to understand Aquinas. Matt, thank you so much for connecting with us to our brothers and sisters out there with the Catholic Talk Show family. God bless, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.